Hello and welcome to week 10's lectures on Arthur Conan Doyle's The Hound of Baskerville's. In today's session, I'll be talking about the author and providing you uh, with some of the context related to Gothic fiction. Now, Arthur Conan Doyle was born on 22nd May 1859 in Edinburgh into a prosperous Irish family. He trained as a doctor, gaining his degree from Edinburgh University in 1881. He worked as a surgeon on a whaling boat and also as a medical officer on a steamer traveling between Liverpool and West Africa. He then settled in Portsmouth on the English South Coast and divided his time between medicine and writing. A few pointers uh, are important here. He is Irish, that is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is Irish. He's also a physician, he's a surgeon, and there is also a colonial contact um, in terms of his life. Um, there's a reference to West Africa, and we know this is England in the uh, second half of the 19th century when empire was at its height. Conan Doyle split his time between practicing medicine and writing. Sherlock Holmes made his first appearance in A Study of Scarlet published in Beaton's Christmas Annual in 1887. Its success encouraged Conan Doyle to write more stories involving Holmes, but in 1893, Conan Doyle killed off Holmes, hoping to concentrate on more serious fiction. A public outcry later made him resurrect Holmes. Holmes the very well-known detective that uh, we know and love made his uh, first appearance in this work called A Study of Scarlet. Uh, it's again a late uh, Victorian uh, novel and it was immensely popular with the reading public. Doyle uses the same character in many of his works but eventually he got tired of Holmes and he wanted to eliminate that figure from his narratives so that they can be of a different kind. He wanted to do some serious uh, fiction, serious writing, and the implication is that that detective fiction wasn't uh, very serious or highbrow, it was very popular. Nevertheless, uh, his attempt at killing off Holmes was not very successful and the public wanted him back, wanted Holmes back and Doyle buckled to the popular demand and resurrected him in his fiction. In addition, Conan Doyle wrote a number of other novels including The Lost World and various non-fictional works. These included a pamphlet justifying Britain's involvement in the Boer War, for which he was knighted, and histories of the Boer War and World War I, in which his son, brother, and two of his nephews were killed. Doyle also twice ran unsuccessfully for Parliament. In later life, he became very interested in spiritualism. Doyle wrote works which did not have homes uh, in them, he wrote a lot of non-fiction um, as well. The Lost World is a well-known work by Doyle. Doyle was also an apologist for the Empire. He wrote a work on, on the Boer War, a pamphlet on the Boer War, in which he um, rationalized, justified Britain's involvement in that war. Uh, there was a, 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 a family connection with World War I too for Doyle. His son, his brother, his nephews were killed in the war. 
Doyle also uh, was interested in politics. Personally, he ran for parliament uh, unsuccessfully. He did not succeed. He did not win a seat, uh, but he uh, made uh, two attempts at um, getting into the parliament. And uh, later in life, he became very much interested in spiritualism. Now, uh, I would like us to revisit the Gothic context uh, before we look at The Hound of Baskervilles by Conan Doyle. Uh, we need to revisit some of the tropes associated with this subgenre so that we are very aware of the kind of uh, motives and characterizations that we come across in The Hound of Baskervilles. The Gothic era is characterized by the horrific and unknown death, psychological degeneration and mystery are the typical elements intertwined in Gothic literature. The concept of Gothic is ever evolving with prevailing social anxieties dictating what constitutes the macabre. Characterized by what shocks the conscience, the Gothic genre is molded by human nature and fear of the unknown which exists on a continuum throughout history. This is a fantastic uh, characterization by Michelle Miranda about the nature of the Gothic. The Gothic is symbolized by the horrific. It can be anything, but there is an element of horror in the Gothic. There's also something profoundly mysterious about this uh, notion of the Gothic. There is death, we come across deaths. Uh, there is a psychological degeneration, uh, a regression, a going backwards in time in terms of civilizational attributes. So these are some of the key attributes of Gothic literature. We also understand that the Gothic symbolizes the society's anxieties, its desires, its taboos. And we understand that the Gothic mode is dictated by all these pressures. The Gothic is about what shocks the individual's soul, spirit. And we understand that the Gothic is shaped by human nature. The human nature's uh, fear of the unknown, fear of um, horrifying things, tangible and intangible, are embedded in the fabric of the Gothic. And this is not particular to one particular episode in history or one particular period in history. The Gothic is relevant across historical periods because in every age there is horror, there is uh, mystery, there is social anxiety. People are shocked by different things in different uh, periods. So the Gothic is able to respond to all these pressures, all these anxieties, and that's what makes this um, mood very, very um, successful across time. Psychological terror, whether in the form of a monster or a madman, reflects on the atmosphere of a given time period, focusing on the public's deepest fears and anxieties, and forcing the reader to face those fears through a winding maze of darkness and uncertainty. So let's take a particular kind of fear. We can call it psychological fear. The psychological fear can be expressed in the shape of a monster or, or an um, insane person. And this monster or, or crazy figure can illustrate a particular time period's fears and anxieties experienced by that uh, society, by those individuals present in that society. And what is significant about the Gothic genre is that it makes the people face 
those anxieties, those fears through the kind of uh, representations, Gothic representations in that narrative. And there is darkness, of course, there is uncertainty, but these elements are important to think through these various kinds of fears that abound in society. Early Gothic fiction centered in the first half of the 19th century was influenced by the Enlightenment, while the scientific and industrial revolutions of the 18th century brought forth advanced scientific theories and modes of reasoning, social stratification began to see a blurred division between the civilized and uh, the barbaric. With this division, fears of social regression and degeneration were heightened. What separated the man from the beast was not a chasm but a line not so well defined and not so easily avoidable. Gothic fiction in the first half of the 19th century was very much affected by the Enlightenment narrative, the trajectory of the Enlightenment. Remember that um, in Anne Radcliffe's works, the supernatural is explained away. There is a rational reason for some of the apparently supernatural uh, phenomena in um, Gothic narratives, particularly authored by Radcliffe. So this is an impact of the Enlightenment narrative. The scientific and all these industrial uh, changes, revolutions, brought into uh, society uh, sophisticated uh, theories about science, about logic. So while these narratives were being introduced uh, into society, uh, something very interesting was happening in terms of social formation. Uh, there was social stratification, of course. People were put into different uh, classes and, and categories. And the division between human beings as civilized and human beings as barbaric was becoming fuzzy. So there was a blurring of the distinctions between the civilized and the uncivilized. Um, so this kind of attitude also brought in ideas about going backwards in time, social regression instead of social progression and degeneration also came into the picture. Um, the idea that human beings were somehow um, morally, socially, culturally degenerating, losing their civilizational uh, attributes and were somehow uh, becoming primitive uh, as time progressed. So this fear was um, something that was prevalent in the uh, second half of the 19th century. So um, people began to sense that there was not a massive gulf, chasm between uh, the beast and the man. The, the distinction was not very distinct. Um, the, the, there was no um, easy avoiding of um, the possibility that the man could become a beast. Existing on a continuum, Victorian Gothic continued to explore fears and anxieties of society with attention given to the morbid and dark. While the Victorian Gothic era was characterized by epistemological advancement and a romanticism of daily life, the public's fascination with horror and the morbid was still prominent. What evolved during this transition from Gothic to Victorian Gothic was knowledge obtained through developments in science, criminology, and the criminal justice system. Superimposed on the rising attention to crime was the amplification of scientific thought. So the Victorian Gothic is on a continuum with the early Gothic uh, narratives and ideas about uh, what is uh, Gothic. 
Victorian Gothic also performed what the early Gothic did. It it uh, uh, discussed, it it explored, illustrated the fears and horrors of individuals in the in the Victorian period. However, we also realized that there was a massive advancement in terms of the expansion of knowledge. Boundaries were uh, broken, boundaries were uh, expanded, and knowledge became an endless vista. There was also uh, an idealization about the ordinary life, uh, about the every man, about the humble um, figures in society. Yet, yet, in addition to these advancements in science, uh, and and uh, particularly in the fields of medicine, and uh, and and the romantic movement, um, there was also this inevitable uh, obsession with the dark, the morbid, the macabre. So while on the one hand there was um, new fields being uh, set up in terms of uh, criminology, new institutions being organized and, and run very uh, uh, efficiently in that uh, time and age, such as the criminal justice system, um, the subtext was this uh, idea that there was some kind of profound uh, changes happening in relation to the civilizational attributes of man. There was a fear of uh, regression, degeneration, and, um, and, and a kind of a, a reverting back to primitivism. So uh, that domain was also very active. The greatest impacts on Gothic fiction and detective fiction were those works by Edgar Allan Poe and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. While Gothic fiction and detective fiction are distinctly different in style and form, Poe and Doyle were instrumental in linking the two, often through the combination of horror and reasoning. Michelle Miranda puts forth the idea that um, Poe and Doyle were um, gargantuan figures in terms of the gothic and the detective um, subgenres, and um, she argues that uh, even though gothic fiction and detective fiction are two very distinct moods uh, in fiction, um, these writers, Poe and Doyle, were successful in integrating the two distinct uh, subgenres, and and she. Um, lands on the notion of uh, horror being combined with reasoning to uh, to kind of justify this uh, linkage between the two subgenres. If you remember the uh, previous uh, lecture, we did talk about how the Moonstone could also be gothic in addition to being a very, very uh, landmark um, very interesting landmark detective uh, fiction. So uh, there is a kind of uh, overlap in terms of um, gothic and detective fiction because of um, the narrative of crime and crime and its mystery and its motives are, are inevitably uh, most of the time associated with the darkest secrets and darkest anxieties and fears and, and, and um, taboos of human society. Both Poe and Doyle took cues from their own periods in history to isolate existing social anxieties, to cause both fear and relief within the same tale of mystery, fear of the unknown clarified by the use of reasoning and logic, sometimes the hands of the narrator turned investigator, and other times at the hands of the detective. What Poe and Doyle do is that they um, pick up on some of the key anxieties that are prevalent in their own time and they weave this narrative of mystery. Um, at the heart of it is this unknown, the domain of the unknown, which is um, clarified, which is uh, made, um, uh, made clearer by the um, 
by the uh, narrator who sometimes is the investigator or by the detective so the detective or the investigator is throwing light on the dark spot um, and the dark spot is is the mystery is is a, is a crime um, and, and we do not know the perpetrator so we can see how um, the idea of crime itself comes to symbolize various um, aspects of the human soul uh, and, and, and spirit which is uh, which is um, which is associated with the various anxieties in society. A selection of Doyle's tales focused on horror and the supernatural with little to no uh, reference to uh, reasoning. Likely influenced by Poe's tales, Doyle also crafted stories of the locked room mystery style. Doyle's tale, The New Catacomb, parallels Poe's The Cask of Amantadillo, where one man is effectively buried alive on purpose by his trusted acquaintance after following the friend on a seemingly innocent venture. In these stories, both Doyle and Poe rely on trust and vengeance to stir the anxiety of the reader. In some of the tales by Doyle, there is no narrative of reasoning. Things are not logically, reasonably explained away because the emphasis is on the horror and on the supernatural attributes of the story. And uh, we understand that this is because uh, Doyle was influenced uh, by Poe and uh, Poe is known for his locked room mystery style uh, where people are locked up and, and there is horror in that. There is a lot of gothic element in the idea of imprisoning, incarcerating people and the fantastic example that uh, many of us can think about is uh, think of is the cask of um, Amantadillo where a friend is buried alive he is buried um, in, in, in such a manner that it is extremely horrifying and we see how uh, trusting he had been when he entered the catacomb uh, with that uh, friend so it, it's a fantastic story a uh, very claustrophobic and, and and the settings are um, very gothic as well because of the labyrinthine passageways and and uh, the dark um, uh, the dark mysterious uh, ambience that we can sense as the two men walk down uh, into the cellars so this is uh, extremely atmospheric and, and Doyle was influenced by this kind of writing uh, done by Poe. While the Sherlock Holmes series was more aligned with deductive fiction and, and advances in forensic science, some of the tales had remnants of those elements of classic Gothic fiction. Uh, specifically, The Hound of Baskervilles, um, published in 1902, The Adventure of the Devil's Foot, uh, published in 1910, The Adventure of the Creeping Man, 1923, and The Adventure of the Sussex Vampire, published in 1924. In the latter story, upon hearing the possibility of the suspect being a vampire, Holmes asserts, what have we to do with walking corpses who can only be held in their grave by sticks driven through their hearts? It's pure lunacy. So, what is interesting to us is that though Sherlock Holmes is known to be the embodiment of detective fiction, there are elements of um, Holmes narratives, narratives in which Holmes appears, uh, which are uh, gothic in nature because those narratives contain some of the key gothic uh, attributes and uh, there's a list given um, to you there on the slide and we are of course interested in The Hound of Basker Wells published in 1902. The last comment there on the slide seems to be offhand and uh, Holmes seems to be dismissing um, the idea of uh, the vampire. Uh, he says it's pure lunacy and when we 
come to this part of that story, we uh, realize that as expected, Sherlock is able to dispose of the supernatural hypothesis and arrive at a conclusion based on science, reason, and uh, causality. It's not the sucking of blood occurring for uh, thirst of a vampire, but the sucking of a wound from an arrow impregnated with poison to save the life of the injured who is helpless at the hands of the perpetrator. So what we need to know here is that, since we haven't read that um, story for this course, is to understand that it's not the vampire which is the cause of trouble. It's something else. It is related to science. And Sherlock Holmes is able to get rid of a supernatural hypothesis because he understands the workings of science. He is able to fathom that um, science and its instruments are at the uh, heart of this crime. So what is uh, further important for us to note is that science itself can be gothic. Science has a gothic side. Um, especially when we don't understand how it is exploited in the narrative. Science can be extremely mysterious until we understand the way it functions and the way it produces results. So, uh, vampires are gothic, yes they are, but science can also be gothic and we need to kind of understand to what purpose science is used and to what effect. Using observation and confirmation to support his hypothesis, Holmes declares it has been a case for intellectual deduction. But when this original intellectual deduction is confirmed point by point by quite a number of independent incidents, then the subjective becomes the objective and we can say confidently that we have reached our goal. Here, Holmes' observation and ratiocination are supplemented by verification, which brings about a certainty in results. Holmes' linking of a series of independent incidents proves the element of causality. The point here is that Holmes arrives at his uh, conclusion through his methods of deduction. He takes up each and every point, each and every clue, and uh, explores it and, and, and tries to uh, find out more about it. He tests every hypothesis, and uh, through this kind of rational processing, um, his subjective theory about crime becomes uh, objective knowledge, becomes uh, certainty. So, the independent incidents are connected by a chain of reasoning on the part of uh, Sherlock Holmes and this kind of chain of reasoning produces the results which throws light on the uh, mystery. So causality is established. A narrative is woven around a dark uh, matter. So this method is very, very important for us to understand because it's the method of science. It is about experimentation, it is about testing theories and confirming, affirming the results. Now, the Hound of Baskerville's. The Hound of Baskerville's includes several elements characteristic of Gothic fiction. The ominous Baskerville estate and the eerie moor, a hound representing death and evil, and the supernatural elements of the hound haunting the Baskerville estate, a creature upon the moor which corresponds with the Baskerville demon and which could not possibly be any animal known to science, a huge creature, luminous, ghastly, and spectral. There we go. We have the classic a gothic monster for you here. The Hound of Baskerville is detective fiction, but it's also classic gothic fiction. Um, we have an estate called the Baskerville Estate, and the moors in which this estate is set is eerie, it's strange, it's bizarre, it's threatening, and there is a hound haunting this uh, moor, and this uh, hound is supposed to kind of embody um, 
features such as death and evil itself and uh, it could potentially be supernatural too according to the legends uh, um, that are floating about so this creature upon the moor is massive and, and it's kind of ghostly in, in, in nature as well. It seems to be a spirit too. So these are some of the classic cues associated with the Gothic and this is at the heart of this uh, narrative by Arthur Conan Doyle. Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.